Happy Canada Day weekend. I hope everyone is enjoying this beautiful hot weekend. Well, it's hot here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I just hope you're enjoying the weekend, no matter where you're tuning in from. Um, we have a little bit of a different service for you today. It's a little bit more condensed and shorter, but it's still gonna be amazing. So we're gonna head in right now and we're gonna go into worship. Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide this weary soul This big bones and I try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friends tree. He's 
was body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all church. I just want to take a moment to give you a little bit of news, a little bit of information. We have something that we call a connect card that you can connect with us, hence the name connect card. So if you're tuning in for the first time, we would love to hear from you. Uh, ask any questions that you would like, maybe just even let us know that you have checked it out. Any questions about the message or anything about the church, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, also, I just want to mention our ways to give. I am just so excited and so thrilled and so honored to be part of a church that is so deeply generous. And those are your options. 
Uh, and the only real announcement that I have for this weekend is actually exciting. At the Neighborhood Church, it is our Missions Emphasis Weekend, which basically means that we like to support different missions outside of our church walls. It's really important and part of our culture to do so. And so we're going to highlight one, and this one, it is a group from Estonia, and the family's last name is the Cochrans, who we have been supporting for many, many years, and they're part of the POC International uh, Missions. So we are just really excited about that. Um, they are coming to Canada, and so if you are a praying person, we would ask that you pray for their, their time here, that they get here safely, that they get fulfilled and just, you know, poured into, as well as all the sponsorships that they'll need while they're here. So, yeah. And the last thing that we have, if you're used to us, you know that we have memory verses every single month, and it's a brand new one this month. So this month, we are reading out of Psalms 130, verses 1 to 2, and we're going to read this together. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord, pay attention to my prayer. Psalm 130, verses 1 to 2. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Happy Canada Day to everyone, and just good to see everyone in church. Um, we're concluding our series tonight, Habits to Live By, looking at old ways versus new ways. And we've looked at a bunch of topics in this series. We've talked about rest, talked about needing the Holy Spirit's help. Amen? talked about our words, we've talked about right thinking, we've talked about studying the word, and last week we talked about serving. And so tonight we're going to look at the last topic, which I think is in so many ways good for us, whether that's emotionally or spiritually or even mentally. Um, and yet for various reasons and for various excuses sometimes, I think we find ourselves running from it. And so tonight we're going to talk about gathering and community. And since we're going to talk about gathering in community, we'll talk about its opposite as well, which is isolation and loneliness. And so tonight we're going to talk about what it means to live with others in community and relationships, what it means to help one another. What does it mean to be the church? Why does the church gather? What does scripture have to say about that? So we're going to answer those kind of questions. You see, the world that we live in teaches us a lot about this thing called individualism. And the idea behind individualism is to look out for yourself, is to take care of your own needs and to worry about yourself and to try to get yourself ahead. And yet the scriptures don't guide us in that direction, do they? They take us somewhere radically different, somewhere radically better, where it, it involves loving one another and caring for others and putting others first and honoring others above ourselves. And so more on that in a bit, but let's look at some stuff that I think can help us paint a picture about our propensity to isolate rather than to gather together. So the first thing I want to talk about is one of my favorite books, one of my favorite reads of the last 10 years, Tribe by Sebastian Junger on homecoming and belonging. So Sebastian Junger is a journalist, he's a writer. Um, he's best known for his breakthrough book about war. He found himself literally on the battleground of war and wrote about his experiences, made videos about them in such a way that it captured the public's attention and uh, was, actually went on to be really successful. But this was his follow-up book to that and it was called Tribe. And in this book, he writes about the problems that people or sol soldiers often face when they return home from war. And it has been said that many symptoms of PTSD happen to soldiers due to the atrocities and horrors of what they see on the battlefield. And that just makes sense, right? It, it, it's, you couldn't even imagine the horrors and the things that you would see as a soldier on battlefield. And no doubt Sebastian in his book does not deny that this happens. The brave men and women in this capacity deserve honor and respect really in whatever they face. And so clearly that's a big part of it. But what he noticed in his research and being on the battlefield and returning from it himself and in the research of many other doctors and psychologists and experts is that simply returning home after such an event has a great effect on the overall mental health of those who return from war. And so what does he mean by that? Well, think about it this way. When you're on a war assignment, soldiers come together in a way of camaraderie and community like they'd never experienced before. They live together. They eat together. They do life together. They look out for each other. They have each other's backs. They literally put their lives on the line for one another. 
And so they live this lifestyle, and they live it often for a long time. Depending how long the assignment is, they could live this from anything up to a few months to a few years, right? And so this is how they live. They have each other's backs. They support each other. And then when they return home from war, they come into a radically different way of living and existing. A way where maybe their own neighbors next door don't even know who they are. A world in which you could walk around, see hundreds of people, and maybe not even get so much as a smile or a hi. And after spending months or years of being with people in close community, living and supporting one another, to return to a world like this can feel very disconnecting. It can be deeply felt. They go from being a part of a tribe, a selfless community, looking out for those around them, and back into a society of individuals or individualism, where people don't even necessarily feel like they need to say hi to one another. And it can be distraughtful. It can be devastating. It can be alienating. How many people have ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Anyone ever seen that movie before? Great movie. And one of the scenes in the movie that I thought about this past week as I was thinking about this topic was the scene where I think it was the librarian who had spent a life sentence in jail finally got released. And when he got released, he had a very sad ending to what happened to him because he had spent his whole life in, 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 in the prison. He spent his whole time there. It, what, it, he lived in close quarters with people. He was around people all the time. And when he got out of that life that he was living, he was all of a sudden just an individual in another city, in another place who didn't know anybody and who didn't really know how to cope. It was a sad ending to it. You see, Sebastian Junger makes the point that early in American history, the seeds of what we now call radical individualism were planted, and they began to grow ever since then. You see, think about how easy it is to get lost in a city that you visit for the first time, that you don't know anybody, and that you're anonymous in. For some of us, for a few weeks, that's amazing, right? Like, if you don't mind actually showing up somewhere where no one knows you, you can kind of do your own thing, and you can kind of get by. But living in a place like that for so long, for so much time, can get rather lonely. It can feel isolating, right? You see, truthfully, our cities are even gripped with this idea of individualism, that we take care of ourselves, look out for ourselves, and don't look to anyone for anything. And yet something about living like this goes against how humans were naturally supposed to live together, especially in how the scriptures instruct us. And this especially can affect those of us who live in cities, because when you think about it, cities are notorious for loneliness because we're surrounded by tens of thousands of people, in some cases millions. But most of them are strangers. And cities are transient, and they're always changing, and they're multicultural, and they don't, we don't always have a solid identity. And you have very, sometimes you have very long-term, very few long-term relationships when you live in a city. And so it only makes sense that inside cities, it's easy why so many people can experience what we call loneliness, what we call isolation. And so how does loneliness or isolation affect Christians? How does it affect the church? You see, I won't go into all the numbers, but I read some research this past week. But long story short, church attendance has been cut in half, basically, since the 1950s. Statistically, church attendance has been cut in half since the 1950s. And it's easy to read that and think to yourself, well, that's because of secularism. That's because of the world's influence. Um, that's because of the decline of the church. We can make all sorts of excuses about that. But what that misses is, is it's not just church attendance that's in decline. But gathering anywhere, everywhere is actually going down as well in our world. Robert Putman from Harvard University wrote this book, great book, called Bowling Alone. And in this book, he talked about one of the things that used to bring people together, and that, of course, was bowling. The book's a bit old now, but it's still a go-to resource when discussing individualism. But he makes the point that it's not just church attendance that's in decline, but it's any and all forms of community, in particular, any form that requires commitment to something and to say you're going to be regular about it. And so hence the name's book, Bowling Alone. Now, how many of us in this room are in a bowling league? Anyone? Anyone on a bowling team? I don't see one hand, okay? And that's actually the answer I was, I was hoping I'd get because I wrote that in my notes, okay? But uh, none of us... <laughs> 
bowl anymore, right? None of us are like, you know, I have a high level of commitment to a bowling team or whatever. But the crazy thing is that used to be a thing. That used to really be a thing. You see, I remember growing up like this. My parents bowled, and I loved bowling night. It happened once a week because my older cousin would come over and babysit us. And then we got away with all sorts of shenanigans that night, right? But they went bowling. They had a commitment to it. They loved it. The bowling league was packed. It was actually tough to get in back in the 80s. I remember sometimes they'd even go on bowling tournaments. They'd travel together. They had commitment to community. And you know what? They didn't avoid it. They actually really looked forward to it. They actually really liked doing this. And it was very normal at one time. But since that time, since the 80s, it's been all down. Not just church attendance, but even the bowling leagues and the country clubs and all sorts of gathering spots. Gathering has not taken a high priority in our Western society. Rather than coming together, society has more so decided to go it alone. Check this out. I I remember reading about this, but I checked this out this past week. In 2018, Theresa May made global news when she appointed a loneliness minister in the UK. She actually appointed a minister who was in charge of loneliness. And this was based on a study that 9 million British people, about 20% of the population, actually identified in a study as lonely. And in her statement to the press, she said... Far, for far too many people, lonely is the, loneliness is a sad reality of modern life. And so to tackle such a thing, it was having an effect on health, it was having an effect on how people lived, on quality of life. To tackle such a thing, as a leader of that nation, she actually appointed a minister specifically with the portfolio of attacking loneliness. And now, I know we could sit here and think to ourselves, well, that's just a UK problem, but I don't think that's just a, a UK problem. Studies would show that that's true of a lot of Western societies. You see, here's the truth. Life is not meant to be lived in isolation or alone. But we're created to be with others in community. We need each other. You see, maybe some would say to me tonight, but aren't we more connected than ever online? How we can keep up with each other's lives? Aren't we more connected on social media? How can you still be lonely? Well, the research into this is shocking, maybe not shocking. It depends on how you look at it. But our social media engagements have no relationship to our experience of loneliness. You can have 1,800 Facebook friends and still feel lonely. In fact, some of the research on this tells us that social media can actually worsen the problem. Researchers call this social snacking is a term they use. This is a social media phenomenon of getting empty relational calories in our engagement in social media. It has the appearance of connection, but it doesn't fill the void. It's the illusion of being relational, but it's not the substance that we need. And worse yet, if you're lonely, social media actually tends to wire us for comparison. How many of you know we all post our best stuff on there, right? Right? I always post my happy events, right? I always post my exciting events, and we post our best stuff on there. And so social media can sometimes cause us to compare our lives with the curated and often false projections of what others tell us about their lives. And comparison is really the thief of joy. Comparison makes us ask questions like, well, why don't I have what they have, or why am I not like they are? This This is to say that virtual connections can't replace the need for genuine human connection. Technology alone cannot solve the problem of loneliness. And so we know that we were made to be in relationship with other people, to live and walk together, and the scriptures teach us who follow Jesus that walking with each other is important. And so what does it look like? You see, there are many reasons we come together tonight. (laughs) Many reasons we gather together on a weekend. A big part of it is to look at the scriptures, is to worship together, to pray, to build one another up. There's a lot of reasons we come together But don't take my word for it. Let's look at the text. What does the Bible say about it? Why do we gather together? Here's some reasons why we gather together. Number one, because scripture tells us to. And you can't do life alone. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. 
You see, the context matters in this portion of scripture. The writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to the Christians and basically saying that things are tough right now. They're facing persecution. They're facing tough times. They're going through tough times. And in the midst of that, the encouragement is don't shrink back and don't ever give up meeting together because you need each other. You need to be together. You can't do life alone. So don't give it up. In fact, when you come together, make sure that you spur each other on towards love and towards good deeds and to push one another. Encourage. You see, Scripture never, ever says to go solo. Never, ever says that you have to live out this faith walk by yourself. You can't do life alone. And so the Scripture always instructs us, don't give up meeting together, but come together. And so what do we do when we come together? Number two, we come together because we worship, we pray, we grow in Christ together. The point of our meetings isn't just, you know, some ritual that we do just for the sake of it, but we want to know Jesus better. We want to know him. We want to worship him. We pray for one another. We encourage each other. You see, Colossians 3.16 says it like this, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing unto God with gratitude in your hearts. You see, when we come together, we worship him. Amen? We, we, we hear the word. We look into the word. We, we, pr- we have opportunity for prayer. We have opportunity to go deeper into the things of God and the things that God has for us. You see, any look through the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus' priority was always his people together. Even the Lord's Prayer, it, it never said, my Father in heaven. It said, our Father in heaven, Right? Never said, forgive me my sins, forgive us our sins. The idea was always community, was always that the church would walk together, that the church would love each other, that the church would do life together. I read this definition of loneliness this past week. I don't know who wrote it, okay? So, but I I read it this past week, and I, I like what it said. Loneliness isn't the physical absence of other people. It's the sense that you're not sharing anything that matters with anyone else. And when we come together, we come together for the Lord, amen? We come together for what matters most. We come together, and we're not just here pointlessly. We're here to worship him. We're here to grow. We're here to learn. We're here to to seek him. You see, loneliness isn't just the absence of other people. It's a sense that you're not sharing anything that matters with anyone else. And that's why, that's a big reason why I think the church gathers together. is because we're on the same team. We're serving the same Lord. We're walking together in this. Number three, a third reason why we gather together is to encourage and build one another up. It's to encourage each other. Not, 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 not to be tough on each other, not to be critical of each other, but to encourage one another, to build one another up, to love each other. First Thessalonians 5.11 says it like this, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. The Bible places a big emphasis on this. In Psalm 133, it says, How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. You see, when Jesus left the earth, the last thing he prayed in John 17 was that his church would be one, that they would be one, and that the world would see that, and that the world would see him through that. It's a good thing when the church lives in unity, amen? It was a priority for Jesus. It was such a priority for him that it was one of the last things he prayed before he went to the cross. That thought convicts convicts me sometimes because I have to ask myself, how often do I spend praying for unity of the church when I go to God in prayer? It seemed to be a high priority for Jesus. Romans 14, 19 says, there, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. I love that it says mutual edification. Because it's not just about me. It's not just about me getting something out of this. It's not just about me being filled. It's not just about me being encouraged. But my prayer is that everyone gets that too. And that we edify each other. And that we encourage each other when we come together. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, lesson, revelation, tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. The church is best when we're building each other up. Amen? Number four. Another reason why we all come together is because we all have a role to play in the body of Christ. Each one of us has a role to play. Each one of us has been given a gift. Each one of us has been given talents, and we need to use them. And when we fail to use them, not only are we hurting ourselves, but we're hurting the overall body because we need your contribution. 
Pastor Yasmin did such a great job last week talking about serving and just how everyone has an area where they can serve in and we just need that contribution. Everyone plays a part. We all have a role to play in the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says this, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. End of story. Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone's important. Everyone has a part to play. And when we don't play our part, not only does it hurt us because we're not exercising the gifts and talents that God's given to us for the overall good of the church, but it also affects everyone else negatively because we need you. We need your contribution. We need your gifts at work. And finally, number five, another reason why we gather together is because it reminds us that we're not alone in our walk with Christ. How many of you can get comfort from that? Anyone, right? We don't do this alone. We don't walk alone. We have each other. We have others who can walk with us, others who can encourage us when we need it, others who can help us get up when we fall, others who can, you know, laugh with us when we need to rejoice. But we need to remember that we're not alone. And when we walk with Jesus in Romans 12, 10, it says be devoted to one another in love, to show devotion to one another, care for each other, right? Honor one another above yourselves. This devotion reminds us that we're not alone, that we don't walk this race alone. We don't do this by ourselves, but he is with us and we are with one another. But community can sometimes be difficult. How many of you have experienced this? Anyone? <laughs> okay, some people are being honest about it. <laughs> because we don't all think alike, do we? We don't all have the same interests. We don't all have the same views on issues. Sometimes we have opinions where we don't necessarily meet in the exact same spot. And so what do you do when that happens? How do you continue to live out this thing that Jesus has planned for us, even when it gets kind of messy and difficult? Well, let's illustrate. Because Jesus put together this group of people known as the 12 disciples. And when he put together this group of 12 disciples, Jesus picked people who were so radically different from one another to form this team to form this group, to form a team who would live together in community. So let's read about it. Matthew chapter 10. It says, Jesus called the 12 disciples to him. He gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And these are the names of the 12 apostles. Simon, who's called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now notice that Matthew has a moniker next to two of them. A couple of them are identified by their family, but two of them have a moniker. There's somebody up there named Matthew the tax collector, right? And Simon the Zealot. So why does Matthew specifically point that out? Why do they have a moniker next to their name that helps describe them? Well, let me say this. These are not people in this group of 12 who would have necessarily followed each other on Facebook, okay? Who would have necessarily been Instagram friends or been doing weekend camping trips together if it was up to them and left to themselves. You see, community doesn't mean everyone will think like you do and be like you. Community happens lots in the midst of our diversity, in the midst of our differences. Think about social media. How many of you have ever noticed an algorithm on your social media, anyone? And have you ever said something out loud only to a few hours later go onto your social media and see an advertisement for it and feel really creeped out? Anyone? You didn't type anything in. You just spoke near your phone and you saw this stuff, right? And it tells you and brings things to you that it thinks you like, that it thinks you want to see. So you could look at it often because obviously you want to be around stuff that you like and that you agree with. I think this filter bubble that we see on social media in a lot of ways is a good image for what's happening in our time. We typically surround ourselves with ideas, interests, and people who already reinforce what we already believe. And this can lead to us writing others off who think differently than us. And the filter, sorry, 
And it's not a stretch to suggest that we are increasingly distanced from those from whom we disagree with. Some of us just, you know, we don't want to have the discussion, right? But this was not Jesus' approach. Think about it. When he called his 12 disciples together, the people who were going to be a part of his inner core and change the world with him, he didn't call 12 people together who looked the same, who thought the same, who had similar ideologies. Not at all. In fact, Jesus called together 12 men who would have had some serious reservations with one another. Jesus put together a group of people who most certainly wouldn't have come together on their own will, yet in forming the 12, he was symbolically making a statement that in his kingdom, a new family was being created. And it would not follow the ideas of the world and of human nature out there, but it was the kingdom that God wanted. And just to show an example of some, of the 12, of some tension that the 12 disciples might have faced, let me use one quick example. Consider Matthew the tax collector and Simon the Zealot. If you, if you know any background about these two, you know that Matthew worked for the government in Rome, and Simon hated the government. Matthew didn't just work for the government, he collected revenue for the Romans, often at the expense of hurting and ripping off his own people, and Simon rebelled against that same government, even using force. You see, Matthew was wealthy because of this, and Simon would have been working class. And Matthew made a living taking advantage, taking advantage of people like Simon, and Simon made a living trying to take down people like Matthew. Now use your imagination when these two got together. Imagine what morning coffee would have been like that next day, right? There would have probably been tension. There would have probably been some, right? And yet, despite all their differences and all this working against them, Matthew and Simon were able to remain connected, if you read through the rest of the text. But it would have cost them something. Don't miss that. It would have cost them something. You see, Matthew would have had to stop taking advantage of people like Simon, and Simon would have had to embrace a different view of revolu revolution. And despite their incredible differences, they were able to live together in unity. But in order to do so, it had to cost them something. They had to lay something down. And this is the essence of the family that Jesus was creating. In order to love and remain united with one another, it's always going to cost us something. It's going to cost us to have to bite our tongue sometimes. It's going to cost us to not have to do everything we can to win the argument and make the other person feel silly. Sometimes it's just going to we're just going to have to put up with some stuff that's just going to drive us a little crazy on the inside, right? In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says this, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. You see, the call to love God and love people is not somehow nullified by people who are different or think different or act different than we do. But as disciples, as Christians, we're called to love people simply because that's how God treats us. He loves us. Amen? And we show grace to others because we also have experienced grace. And this is maturity. This is how disciples live and walk with one another, whether they agree on everything or not. And so what does community require of you? Quick, three quick thoughts. And you know what? We're going to eat some cold treats and hang out and put this into application. But number one, what does community require of you? Number one, I think it requires commitment. I think that's a huge part of community, is just committing to be a part of something. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you're frustrated, even if someone said something they're annoyed, just, just commit to it. Be a part of it. Stick with it. Stick it out. David Brooks, an author, writes this. He writes, our society suffers from a crisis of connection, a crisis of solidarity. We live in a culture of hyper-individualism. There is always a tension between self and society, between the individual and the group. Over the past 60 years, we have swung too far towards ourselves, to the, the, sorry, the self. The only way out is to rebalance, to build a culture that steers people towards relation, community, and commitment. The things we most deeply yearn for, yet undermine with our overly, with our hyper-individualistic way of life. You see, at the end of the day, we all crave those things. We all crave community. We all want relationships. We, we recognize that it's commitment that's going to get us there. And we're going to have to be committed. 
You see, to live in community, we have to commit. And right there, that's a deal breaker for some of us. That's a difficult thing for us to do, to show up every single Wednesday night or Saturday night. Like, what if something else better comes up? There needs to be a commitment, not just to what you want, but to the group, to the community, to the people around you. And it's much deeper than that, to commit to a community and to even just live under the authority of that way. To commit to loving one another, even when you're annoyed or even when you disagree. Commitment matters when it comes to community. What does community require of me? What does it require of you? It requires commitment. It requires that we're going to say we're going to be a part of it. When it comes to the church, we are going to do everything we can to build each other up. We're going to do what we can to encourage one another. We're going to do everything we can to help each other know Jesus better and come closer to him. Commitment. Number two. What does community require of us? It's going to require forgiveness. You know what? We're going to upset each other sometimes. People will fail you. You will probably fail people. Okay, I said probably to be nice, okay? But we all, we all make mistakes. None of us is perfect, right? In Ephesians 4.32, it says, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And I love how it says that at the end. How do we forgive one another? Well, just as God forgave you. The whole purpose and source of forgiveness is the forgiveness you've received yourself from God. And so just as you've received that, then give it away, is what Ephesians would say. Right? Sometimes in community, we're going to upset each other. And we're going to need to sit down and have discussions and just learn to forgive, learn to love, learn to move on, learn to keep going. Um, Henry Nowen, I was studying this the other day. And he had a radical way of putting it. I'm still not quite 100% convinced I understand this, okay? But let's read it anyway. Forgiveness means that I continually am willing to forgive the other person for not being God. For not fulfilling all my needs. I too must ask forgiveness for not being able to fulfill other people's needs. The interesting thing is that when you can forgive people for not being God, then you can celebrate that they are a reflection of God. And I read deeper about this, and I thought, wow, what a crazy thought. Because if we go into our relationships with unrealistic expectations, if you expect someone to be like God to you, who's perfect and never does anything wrong, never gets anything wrong, never makes mistakes, never has faults, you have an unrealistic view of community and of relationships. But I love how Nowen says this. I love what he says here. Forgiveness means that I'm continually and I'm willing to forgive the other person for not being God, for not being able to fulfill all my needs. And I too need to have that, I too can't do that for other people. And when we're able to recognize this, then we're able to see God's image in each other better. We're able to see the love that God has for each other better. We're able to see that we all need grace together just as much as each other. We all need mercy just as much as the other person needs, okay? We're able to see ourselves in the light that God sees us. What does community require of us? Well, we need to be committed, but we also, we need to be good at forgiving. And I'm not going to act like that's always easy. And I'm not going to act like that's always simple. Because I recognize sometimes that goes really deep. And yet the scripture always, never points to ourselves. It always points to what God has done for us. Forgive one another just as in Christ. God forgave you. Amen? Number three, final point. What does community require of us? Community requires love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this book called Life Together. I read it this week. It's only 90 pages, so I won't pat myself on the back, okay? Eh? But it's a great book. If you ever want to check out a real good Christian theology on community, check this book out. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together says this. He says, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. Welcome to church. But the person who loves those around them will create community. That was one of those ones I underlined. And I sat there thinking about that. And I sat there thinking about what he was trying to say. And it's kind of similar to what Henry Nowen was trying to say in the forgiveness part we just looked at. But in other words, if you are too idealistic about community and you try to force that on what you expect community to look like, you probably will ruin it. Because you need to recognize that we're all human. 
And sometimes we run into challenges. And sometimes we face tension. And sometimes there's great times. And sometimes it's exciting. And we love it. But I understand what Dietrich's saying when he says the person who loves their, their own dream of community, what they think it should look like, will destroy it. But the person who loves people around them, they'll create community. Loving people despite th their differences in behavior, despite their thoughts or opinions that annoy you, despite their politics, despite the things that can really tear us apart. Loving people simply because God loves them and loves us, that person will create healthy community. And so community does not mean connectedness. Community does not even mean chemistry, okay? Sometimes there's not a lot of chemistry at start. You have to work on that. We can be very different people and have little chemistry, but community is that there is something common that brings us together. And in this case, it's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus brings us together. And we may not have all the same interests. We may not have all the same hobbies. You might tell me a story about hunting, and I'm going to be like, what is hunting, right? Like, you, you know what I mean? We might not all know the exact same stuff or have the same opinions on everything, but what we have is amazing. What we have in common is greater than any of that, and that's Jesus. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in following Christ and walking along each other in that pursuit, as we follow him and walk along one another, in that, we're going to find the community that we need, right? In that, we're going to find the true community that we long for. You see, Jesus brings us to him, and he asks us to love him, but he also asks us to love one another. And forever, we're all together in him forever, right? And so the whole source of community is Christ. The whole, the, the focus point is him. Jesus brings us to him, asks us to love each other, and forever we're all together in him as Christians. And I think 1 Peter 4, 8 said it best. I'm going to read it one more time. Above all, above all, most importantly, most important of all, the NLT says, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude a sins. How many of you know you can't do life alone? Amen? The Bible never intended for us to do that. We may, may we not miss out on this gift of the church and community. Amen? And of encouraging each other. And may we always be the church as we love one another and as we all seek to follow Jesus Christ together. Amen? Let's embrace that. Let's love one another. Let's pray. God, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your word instructs us, Lord, to never give up the habit of gathering together, Lord. And as we come together, God, I pray that people would be built up. I pray they'd be encouraged. I pray they'd be uh, forgiven, Lord. I pray that people would just love one another and that we would spur each other on towards good deeds and good works and to the things that you have for us, Lord. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness and grace that you've shown each one. Lord, may you, by your Holy Spirit, by power, Lord God, that we don't always have, help us to also share that with other people. Help us to love those around us. Thank you, Lord, just for setting us that example. And I just pray a special blessing upon every person in this room tonight, Lord. I pray you would bless them immensely. I pray, God, you draw them closer to you. I pray, God, they would know your love and your grace and forgiveness more and more each day, that it would encourage them, that it would spur each one on to good deeds, and that above all else, you, God, not us, you would be lifted up. And I pray that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed yourself from the very beginning of this service with worship right into the message. And I just want to encourage you with Pastor Jordan's message here, this last uh, message in the Habits to Live By series, is to gather. So I know right now you're checking it in uh, online, so that's kind of a hard thing to say. But you know what? Maybe you invite somebody over for dinner tonight. Maybe you go for coffee with somebody. Maybe a bunch of you get together and watch um, this service next weekend together. So I encourage you to gather. It's very important. We are meant to do life together, not alone. So I encourage you to do that this week. So you have had church. Now let's go and be the church.